You're listening to The Taylor Marshall Show, episode 118. We're talking about the virtue of prudence. Howdy, and thank you for tuning in to The Taylor Marshall Show. This is the podcast for everyone who wants to create daily habits and learn enough theology to take their faith to the next level. My goal this week is is to introduce to you how the virtue of prudence can reshape your life into a pattern of excellence, success, and of course, spiritual holiness. Well, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening wherever you are in the world, and welcome back to the Taylor Marshall Show. And I want to lead off, usually I don't do this, but I'm going to lead off with a review on iTunes. And this is from uh, someone who left a five-star review last week named, they put their name Master Hagen, and he wrote, this is simply the best Catholic podcast on the internet, end quote. So Master Hagen, thank you for that. I love podcasts. I listen to podcasts every day, a number of them, and uh, I really appreciate that compliment that this is the best podcast on the entire internet. And today we're talking about the most important cardinal virtue so much so that dante gave this virtue personified three eyes because prudence is what allows us to see the world as it is to see it as god sees it through his infinite and supernatural providence we see it participating in that through the virtue of prudence before we jump into that though uh, i just want to share Some personal things that are going on in the life. Our little baby, our eighth baby, Margaret Carroll, turns one this Saturday. She was born a year ago on the feast of St. John Paul II. And so we gave her the middle name of Carol after Carol Wojtyla, John Paul II's baptismal name. We thought adding the name Margaret John Paul II Marshall was a little bit too clunky. We thought of a feminine version like Margaret, Joan, Paula, but that sounded a little bit contrived. So I came up with Carol um, after Carol Voitia. So her name is Margaret Carol Marshall. So she turns one. We're excited about that. Um, I'll be heading off with the older boys to a camp out with the Troops of St. George. This is an organization that I began and founded three years ago. It's outdoor adventure for priests, for deacons, for fathers, for sons. This weekend, we will be shooting firearms in a very safe and controlled way. But uh, our troop thinks it's important that both the men and the young men know about firearm safety. Um, They know the rules and the laws about firearms. And of course, they know how to properly use it and actually be good at firing a weapon. So Uh, We'll be teaching that this week. Pretty excited about that. I know my sons are. We've done a lot of gun safety um, and even hunting together. So they know some of this. But as a father, I always want my sons to be growing in awareness and in safety. So we're looking forward to that. Um, Last weekend, we went to San Antonio, went to a beautiful Catholic church, the Church of St. Joseph downtown. Um, My oldest son and my older two daughters, the twins, had a track meet representing great hearts and uh, I think the I think overall the school came in second I can't quite remember if it was the boys team the girl team or both but they did very well I was really proud of them and we spent the weekend there seeing San Antonio going on the river walk sea world and um, going to that beautiful church downtown St. Joseph's a historic German church in San Antonio. A lot of people don't know that Texas, especially central Texas, is very German. And up until recently, well, actually, I think even now there are still parts that speak German here in Texas. In fact, where I grew up in Fort Worth, Texas, in the 80s, my friend, my best friend was a Lutheran, and one of their services at church in Fort Worth, the early service, was still entirely in German, German hymns, German sermon, and everything. So, There is a strong German tradition here in Texas, and we got to experience that at St. Joseph's in San Antonio. Um, I've been continuing with the Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, 
And that's been fantastic. A little bit of, of sore elbows and sore fingers from grabbing the gi, but it's been uh, a journey. It's I talked about it before on the on the blog. Uh, it's very humbling because I go in there and I'm a, I'm a bigger guy, but there are smaller guys that are 50 to 70 pounds smaller than me that can just thrash me on the mats. Uh, Jiu-Jitsu is a form of wrestling. It's grappling. And... Um, it's fun. I mean, it's humiliating. It's fun. It's exhausting. The other night I was rolling. We call it rolling. You know, we're rolling around grappling so hard. At the end of it, when I left, I really thought I was going to throw up. I was just so beat down. Um, but I did get my first stripe. I'm a white belt, which is the lowest, commonest um, belt in all of jiu-jitsu. But I did get my first stripe, so I'm making some progress. That was exciting. And um, part of my interest in getting into jiu-jitsu was my fascination with this guy, Jocko Willink. Jocko Willink was a Navy SEAL. Um, he's written a best-selling book. And he teaches about basically being tough and being disciplined, and as he says, getting after it. And I was introduced to him through the uh, Joe Rogan podcast and the Tim, originally for the Tim Ferriss podcast. And uh, I was just fascinated with Joe Willink. Uh, sorry, jo Jocko Willink is his name. Jocko Willink. And I started listening to his podcast. And it's really good. There is, you know, if you have younger kids, I wouldn't listen to it because it is military. And um, there's a lot of, there's some violence depicted in it. Him describing past events, battles, um, and occasionally a little profanity. Um, but Jocko keeps it pretty clean usually. So I, I would check him out. I, I really like Jocko Willink's podcast. At first, I thought he's making up a bunch of stuff because he's just so incredible. This guy gets up at... I don't know, it's like 4.30 or 5.30 every day. He's deadlifting. He's squatting. He's a black belt in jiu-jitsu. He runs a company. He's just a high-energy guy. And he's not just a jock, but he has a great mind. And I, I really like listening to him. And I'm challenged by him constantly. So I'd encourage you to check him out and follow him on Twitter as well. And uh, let's see, we're in fall break. The kids are out of school. So that means I get to see him a lot this week. But also means it's been hard to do work. Um, because my off the main office that I use is at the house and the kids are here and they're a distraction. So they're not here right now. So I've got the microphone on and I'm recording a podcast here at the house. Um, and yeah, that's about it. Uh, if you're interested in going to Fatima in 2017 for the 100 year anniversary of the apparition of our lady, the Theotokos exterminatrix of all heresies, she appeared in Fatima, Portugal, 99 years ago and so next year is the 100 year anniversary and i'm trying to put together a pilgrimage so if you want to travel with me to europe and uh, go to fatima and go to spain and go to france and see mary and shrines and apparition sites let me know reach out to me you can do that taylormarshall.com that's the website so we're going to start this week with the topic of prudence last time uh, actually, two episodes ago, before I interviewed um, Father Donald Cowley about the rosary, I talked about the four cardinal virtues as an introduction. So you don't have to go back to that one, but I would encourage you to listen to it because I talk a, a lot about what virtues are. Um, that's episode 116. Uh, I talk about what virtues are, that they're good habits, vices are bad habits. And I kind of kick it off and I give you the Latin for pr uh, where the Latin word prudence comes from. And today we're going to talk about the philosophy and theology of prudence. And in order to help us with that, we are going to turn to none other than, as you might guess, St. Thomas Aquinas, uh, my favorite theologian of all time, bar none. And he talks about the virtue of prudence in the Summa Theologiae. If you have a copy of it, you can follow along with us. If not, no worries. This is in the second part of the second part. In Latin, we say the secunda secunde partis. Um, Thomas Aquinas wrote the Summa, which he never finished, in three parts. But the second part was so big that they divided the second part into two halves, A and B. So you have the first part of the Summa. You have the second part of the Summa, which has the first of the second part and the second of the second part. A little bit confusing. And then you have the third part. There's also what's called the supplement, which his assistant 
Reginald finished after Thomas Aquinas died in the grand year of 1274 on March 7th. So prudence is addressed by St. Thomas Aquinas in the Secunda Secundae, beginning at question 47 and being completed at question 56. So he dedicates here nine questions divided up into articles on the topic of prudence. And of course, for the sake of time, we're not going to go through every single question article. That would probably take about 10 to 12 hours to go through. Instead, we're just going to hit the high points. And I want to focus primarily on how prudence applies to you becoming virtuous, becoming successful, and then becoming a saint, finding sanctity. What's great about the cardinal virtues, and I mentioned this in the intro podcast, episode 116, is that the virtues habituate us. They create this groove in our soul that makes it easier and easier over time to be virtuous. It's creating a good habit. Now, of course, life and our good Lord is always presenting us with new challenges, which often test our resolve in our virtues. But as you practice virtue, they become more and more, as we might say, quote unquote, second nature. They're not natural in that way. They can be infused or we can actually work on them and deepen them. Now, if you're a baptized Christian, if you're a believer, if you love Jesus Christ, you hope in him and the resurrection, you have faith in him and all the teachings of the church, everything taught in the Bible, everything taught in sacred tradition, you already have prudence. The Catholic Church teaches that when you're baptized, you're given faith, hope, and charity, faith, hope, and love, but also infused into your soul are the cardinal virtues. So this is like a bonus pack bonus feature that God infuses into you. Now, what's the word infuse mean? It's related to Latin. It it just means poured into. So think of a, here I have a a can here on my table. Um, I like to drink LaCroix. If you're not into LaCroix, this is tip of the week. I had a tip of the week, but I'm going to scrap that one. I drink LaCroix like none other. It is sparkling water that has flavor in it. I'm drinking the orange flavored sparkling water. LaCroix it comes in a can. You can hear it. Hear it. There's the can. And I've been doing Exodus 90, which is a 90-day program for Catholic men, which entails cold showers, lots of working out, no sugar, um, no alcohol, a bunch of other stuff. And so I haven't been able to drink alcohol or really any drinks, but I drink this water, the uh, LaCroix. It's spelled L A. C R O I X, the cross, right? LaCroix. Highly recommended. I'm drinking these every day. Love it. I love carbonated water. The problem is, is when I drink it during a podcast, um, I sometimes have to burp a little bit, which is embarrassing. So I try not to drink it during the podcast, but I'm thirsty, so I'm doing it now. Anyway, the reason I brought up this can of LaCroix is you can think of your soul at conception. Your mom and your father come together, and you are conceived. There's a soul. There's a body. The soul is created ex nihilo, out of nothing, by God in that moment. Your soul does not derive from your mommy's soul and your daddy's soul. That is a false teaching, a heresy called traducianism. Catholic Church does not hold to that. Those certain church fathers, like Tertullian, who's not a saint, did hold to that teaching. Um, And maybe, this is controversial, maybe Augustine early on held to that tradition. I cover that in my book, Augustine in 50 Pages, if you're interested. Anyway, so this can is like your soul when you're conceived. And it's empty. There's nothing in the can. Why is it empty? Because of original sin. You don't have grace when you're conceived. You don't have righteousness You don't have love, you don't have faith, you don't have hope, you don't have anything in your soul, unless you're the Blessed Virgin Mary with the Immaculate Conception. Now, that might offend you. You may think, well, God makes all babies um, with dignity, of course, but that doesn't mean that all babies, when they're conceived, have grace in their soul. We're empty. This is what we call original sin. And then at baptism... Or if you're older, when you come to faith, 
God pours in to the can, into here. He pours in grace, sanctifying grace. He might also pour in special actual graces, but sanctifying grace is what saves you, so that's poured in. He pours in faith. He pours in hope. He pours in charity. Now you may say, well, what about a baby? Does a baby have faith in Jesus? If the baby is baptized, yes, the baby has faith in Jesus. It's poured in. But then God also tops it off with the cardinal virtues. So he pours in the prudence, pours in the justice, pours in the fortitude, pours in the temperance. And as we mentioned in the previous podcast, uh, prudence, justice, fortitude, temperance, the four cardinal virtues can be remembered by the trick that I created, which is very cheesy, but you'll not forget it is peanut butter, jelly, French toast. Peanut butter, jelly, French toast. I'm allergic to peanuts. I don't eat peanut butter, but I can remember it. So PJFT, prudence, justice, fortitude, temperance. So God pours all four into your can, and there you go. You're saved. You are equipped. God has given you what you need. Now, over time, we can do stupid things. We can sin venally. We can sin mortally. And when we do that, we pour out the gifts that God's given us. And through prayer and through penance and through the sacraments, through reading scripture, through studying, through listening to a good podcast, um, to acts of charity for the poor, for the sick, for the suffering, by going to confession, all these things, we can fill up the can even more so. So that's kind of a tangible understanding of how our soul works and how it works in relationship to these virtues. Now, Thomas asks, he kicks it off in question 47. He, he asks, is prudence in us naturally? Now, prudence is a natural virtue. A person can have prudence and not be saved. You see, there's the theological virtues, faith, hope, and charity, and there's the cardinal virtue, prudence, justice, fortitude, temperance. You could be a Muslim. You could be a Hindu. You could be an atheist. You could be a Buddhist. You could be Jewish. And you could still have a measure of the natural virtues of prudence, justice, fortitude, and temperance. So, like, look at someone like Socrates or Cicero. They can be prudent about certain decisions, even though they don't have faith in Jesus, they don't have hope in Jesus, they don't have love for Jesus, they worship idols or they're atheists or whatever. They can have a measure of these virtues. And this is kind of where Catholicism breaks with Protestantism. Protestantism, Protestants kind of sees everybody as saved and non-saved and we're the same way. You're either saved or you're not saved. You're in a state of grace or you're not in a state of grace. But then we also have a recognition that God's gifts, even virtues, can be maintained and developed by people without grace. Now, this does not save them. Just by being a prudent Jewish person or a prudent Hindu, that doesn't mean that you're going to heaven and you're saved. You're saved by grace through faith, as St. Paul says. you got to have grace through faith in order to be saved. And as we also know, Paul says, faith working in love, faith that's active. So just being a good person without faith, Paul says, is not enough. We're saved in and through Jesus Christ, who paid the only price for the penalty of our sins. So while it's true that one can naturally, and in a state of nature without grace, develop the virtues and develop prudence, as Thomas says in Article 15, it's not something in us naturally. It's not like all babies are born with prudence. It's not like all babies have a software called Microsoft Prudence already running on the hard drive when they come out of the womb. No, as we see in Thomas, prudence, like all the cardinal virtues, has to be developed. 
We have to acquire the virtue. How do you acquire it? Well, that goes back to our intro podcast. You do it by repetition. If you make a prudent decision one time, that's not a virtue. If you do it 1,000 times, now you have a virtue. So you all see that distinction. Prudence is a natural virtue, but we don't have it by nature. We acquire it in natural ways, but it doesn't come loaded up in our human nature. All right, good. Now, in question 47, Thomas also talks about how prudence is the means by which a man rules himself. So you can think back to like Plato's Republic, where he's talking about the ideal governance, the ideal polis, the political regime. And it's likened, as it is so often in Plato, to the human soul. You have the intellect, you have the will, and then you have the passions, your desires, your emotions. And ideally, your intellect rules as a just king over the rest. It's not a democracy. You know, you in the way your soul works, you don't go down and consult with lust and anger and hunger and sadness and all these emotions and take a vote on what you should do ethically in the next moment. That's, you know, none of the philosophers teach, well, none of the good philosophers teach that. Catholicism certainly denies that because we recognize through original sin, through what's called concupiscence, our passions are out of control. They're not evil. They're just out of control. So if you're a teenage boy on a date with a girl and you're alone and you're thinking, what should I do now? You don't make a democratic decision and ask your feelings and emotions, what's the ethical thing to do right now? Because in that sense, the democracy is going to fail you morally. You're going to make a bad decision. Instead, what we see in Plato, what we see in Paul, what we see in Augustine and Thomas Aquinas, is we must have the intellect strengthened with the power of grace and of virtue that says, no passions, go back down the mountain. We are not going to succumb to anger in this moment. We are not going to succumb to lust. We are not going to succumb to hunger. We're going to do the right thing. This is what St. Paul calls the war between the mind and the flesh. The flesh is always clamoring to do this and that. But the mind, strengthened by God's grace, formed in Christ, says, No, I'm not going to steal that money. I'm not going to steal that food. I'm not going to have sex before marriage. I'm not going to get angry and give the finger to the person who just cut me off. So the royal king, which is the intellect, the mind, the noose, holds the reins to the chariot and tells the wild horses where to run. And so prudence is the virtue by which the royal mind leads the soul, and the body. And this is why Dante gives prudence three eyes in the Divine Comedy. There's a parade, and you see the virtues coming by. They're dressed in purple because they're royal. And leading them is prudence. He's got the third eye. See, prudence allows you to see things correctly. Prudence looks to the heavens it looks to the Decalogue, the Ten Commandments. It looks to natural law. It looks to the order of the universe, the order of human society, and says, what is the right thing to do in this moment, in this very instant? And it doesn't have to be a fancy decision. Prudence might be which minivan should I buy next because I have this much money and I have this, this many children and I can afford this payment or this amount 
Should I get it used? Should I get it new? Which has the best features? How can my wife best transport strollers and groceries in the back? And so on and so forth. That takes prudence. You don't want to make a foolish decision and buy the wrong thing because you just wasted a lot of money, maybe made things more difficult for your wife. You know, maybe she needed both sides of the minivan to open, not just one because of some kind of rule at drop off. I don't know, just making this stuff up. So as a man or as a woman, or as a child, you make the prudent decision. It might be where to go to college. Actually, you know, as I'm thinking about it, it's really every decision. Every decision. Hey, here's a decision right now. Hey, I'm not going to get mad at you right now because I'm talking about prudence. What's your name? Elizabeth. What's your name? You're Elizabeth? Can you say hi, everybody? Say hi. Hi. Okay. Hey, you know what? I'm recording podcast right now. Can you give me a little bit more time? All right. Love you. Bye-bye. All right. There she is, Elizabeth. She's our number seven. Love you, sweet pea. So in every case, it's... Uh, I was about to say, every decision has an element of prudence to it. Um, because every decision you have in life is going to bring you a little bit closer or take you a little bit further from God in your final purpose, which is to be with God forever in heaven, enjoying him and praising him and worshiping him forever. That's your ultimate goal. And so every single decision relates to that final goal. Even the little ones, like buying a minivan, right? Or... Where to eat, because where do you choose to eat has to do with your budget, and it might have to do with occasions of sin, it might have to do with your diet, your health, all kinds of things, right? So prudence is looking at the big picture, looking at the goal. Ultimately, the big picture is you want to be face-to-face with Jesus Christ, surrounded by marrying the saints forever and all the angels forever. That's the ultimate goal. How can I order my day-to-day? To get me closer to that goal as a husband, as a father, as a wife, as a mother, as a priest, as a deacon, as a sister, as a single person, as a teenager, as a college student. How do I order my state in life to that final goal? And of course, prudence is really important in the really big decisions like, should I marry this person? Prudence brings in all the questions of, you know, her parents, her temperament, her faith, her loyalty, her commitment, her personality, her sense of humor, how she might act as a mother, her health. All of these things have to be weighed. And prudence builds upon prudence. So if you make 500 bad decisions... Your next decision will likely be what? A bad decision. You know, people who date the wrong people always seem to start dating the wrong people. You ever notice that? What's up with that? Well, virtue and vice. Virtue is a good habit. Vice is a bad habit. The only way to turn around is to stop, reduce the momentum, and push back the other way. This is why breaking habits is so hard. This is why... Uh, psychologists today say that breaking a habit and creating a new habit takes at least 21 days, maybe six months, usually entails changing a group of people uh, or friendships. So even if it's something as you know small as drinking caffeine, picking your nose, whatever it is, a bad habit, it takes a lot of effort, 21 days minimum just to break it and start a new one okay so thomas you know spends time talking about how prudence is how we rule ourselves 
He then goes on to talk about how prudence can help us rule other people. And he doesn't mean this in a, in a uh, way a, dict a dictator would. He means it as a benevolent king, a benevolent ruler. And he breaks it up into three kinds of rule. He talks about rule in the legislative sense, rule ruling with prudence in a political way, and then ruling in a domestic way. And I think everyone listening can apply these um, to their own lives. I mean, not all of us are legislators. We're not creating laws. But in a sense, you know, if you have a job, if you're a supervisor, a manager, a boss, a CEO, um, you are putting policies in place, rules in place. If you're a parent, you most certainly are setting out rules. If they're teenagers, it might have to do with curfew and who they can hang out with and what they can wear, what they can listen to. If they're younger, it has to do with, you know, you can't eat that, you can't eat that, you can't watch any more television, um, you're playing this sport, so uh, you're getting potty trained, whatever it is. So Thomas talks about how we take prudence, we apply it to other people, not to benefit ourselves, but to benefit them. Ultimately, ruling is about service. This is why Gregory the Great added to his papal title, Servant of the Servants of God. He saw that to be the highest ruler on earth, which is to be the Pope, the man who stands in the place of Jesus Christ in the church on earth, is not to be a demigod, but it's to be a servant of all the servants of God. Now, I want to focus chiefly here, and, and if you're following with me, I mean, I've moved all the way to question 50 in the Summa Theologiae Secunda Secunde. I want to move to the domestic economy of prudence, and this is Article 3 in Question 5. And he says, I'm going to read this whole part here. He says, now it is evident that a household is a mean between the individual and the city or kingdom, since just as the individual is part of the household, so is the household part of the city or kingdom. And therefore, just as prudence, commonly so called, which governs the individual, is distinct from political prudence, so must domestic prudence be distinct from both. Now, Thomas is trying to show that there's a domestic prudence here. But I like how he situates domestic prudence between individual prudence and then political prudence. Let's just think about this for a second. Individually, as a person, I'm supposed to rule my soul. So I don't allow my emotions, my passions to rule me. I rule my emotions and my passions. So if I want to sit there and have a pity party and think about how my life's so awful and so-and-so said this to me or get really angry at what someone's done to me and allow my emotions to take the better of me, I am turning away from prudence. So I need to rule myself. Likewise, the same thing can happen in a kingdom, a city, or a nation. The rulers can deaden the culture by accommodating to the lesser voices of society and culture. This has always been a danger for democracy. This is why the intellectual greats all throughout history, have been skeptical, even hostile towards the idea of democracy. Why? Because you get a mass of people who are uneducated, who are ruled by their passions, and they begin to vote in a way that reflects their lack of morality and their lack of chastity. Ultimately, as some of our founding fathers noted, they begin to vote in order to open up the treasury of the nation to appease their own vicious lifestyles. So you have people saying, hey, I'm going to vote so we can get free abortion. I'm going to vote so we can get government-aided contraception. I'm going to vote for unjust wars. 
I want the government to do this and that and to take away liberties. And soon you have a kind of a tyranny. And, you know, I'm not a prophet. I'm not too involved in politics, but I worry that we're kind of on the threshold of that here in America. I don't see a religious right or a conservative movement based upon the principles of natural law and the Ten Commandments and a Judeo-Christian worldview. It seems we've lost that. And so the years to come are merely going to be people voting for what tickles them wherever they want it to be. Not good. And so prudence would require a nation to resist a sinful populace, according to Thomas Aquinas. How do you feel about that? As Americans, I don't think we like that because we think of our founding fathers, we think of England, we think of our independence, 4th of July, we think of this heavy-handed king who taxed us and didn't let us do what we wanted to do. And so we broke away and we shed blood and we fought and we won our independence and we've become, you know, the greatest nation on God's green earth. That's how we think about it. But is there a need to restrain the people through law? Libertarians wouldn't like this. But of course, the Catholic political tradition is not libertarian. Something to think about. You know, it's something to think about. How is it that we can acquire leaders who have prudence to make right decisions for the people, for their morality, for families, for the poor, for fathers, for men, a place for religious freedom? education, all these things, especially as we look into this presidential election. It's a question I think most of us are scratching our heads about and talking about and even sighing about thinking, how can we get to a level of discourse that actually has virtue in it, that would have a presidential debate that would have prudence, that would have justice that would have fortitude, temperance, how nice that would be. So that's prudence uh, for the person, for the individual, for the society. But then in the middle is the domestic. And I think this is where we can find hope as Christians, as Catholics. How are we going to change the nation? We'll change the nation by perfecting the family. We have to instill in our family virtue. The home is the school of virtue. And so as fathers and mothers and uncles and aunts and grandparents, we need to be teaching prudence, not only with our words, but with our actions, so that our children grow up seeing loving marriages and happy homes and prosperity and health and hope. And if we can do this, if we can raise up a generation in our home in a domestic prudence, I think that's the way that we can reclaim a political prudence. So just to recap here, we have a personal prudence, a domestic prudence, and then he doesn't call it this, but I'll call it it, call it this, a national prudence. And of course, I, we can all see how personally we can improve in prudence in our own lives, how we can do it in our families, domestic, but we need to do it on the national level. The way to do that, I think, is ground up through the family. I'm going to close here with how prudence relates to the Holy Spirit. Thomas says in question 52 that prudence corresponds to the spiritual gift of the Holy Spirit of counsel. Counsel is a gift. St. Gregory the Great says that counsel is is a gift given by God the Holy Spirit to human beings to help them with virtue, and in particular, to help them with the virtue of prudence. It says in Isaiah 11, verse 2, 
The spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him. A little bit further down. The spirit of counsel. So what is counsel? Counsel is the way in which a rational creature like you and me is moved through the research of reason to perform a particular action. This is counsel. So counsel is when you sit back and you think, well, it's like when you take counsel with God. You say, God, should I marry this person? And you just tumble it around in your mind for hours, for days, for months. I don't know, maybe even for some people, even for years. And what you're doing is you're asking for this gift of the Holy Spirit to, as Thomas Aquinas says, the research of reason. The research of reason. So think about it like you're, you're doing a PhD. You're doing research into reason. What is the rational, reasonable thing to do? That gift that God gives you to do that is the gift of counsel. And it's obvious how counsel goes together with prudence because prudence is the deliberation, the deciding of a certain action. So prudence is the virtue, counsel is the gift. They basically sound like the same thing. It's just that the, the gift is what comes from the Trinity, from the Holy Spirit. And prudence is the activity, the virtue, the movement in your own soul to do the right thing. All right, so counsel is the gift. Prudence is the virtue operating in your own soul. Ideally, they're working in synergy. Now, you could have a person, let's say they're an atheist or they're Jewish, and they might make some good decisions. You know, like let's say... Um, you know, they make some some really good uh, domestic decisions about the household over where to live and budgets. You know, they, let's say atheist makes a really good budget for the family and the family prospers and they're able to afford, you know, college um, or they make very good decisions about diet. And so the family is healthy. You know, they're not overweight. They're being prudent. But the atheist would not be able to have access to good counsel from the Holy Spirit because he doesn't believe in the Holy Spirit. So in this sense, the atheist or the, the non-Christian is able to have the virtue of prudence but is lacking in the gift of counsel. The good news for you and me is that we are baptized Christians. We believe in the Holy Spirit. And so whenever we are cultivating prudence, we should always... Seek to stir up the gift of counsel. Now, I mentioned earlier, you know, your soul is like this can. And God pours into it grace, faith, hope, charity, prudence, justice, fortitude, temperance. But he also pours in the gifts. And especially the church teaches in the sacrament of confirmation, the gifts of the Holy Spirit are stirred up and strengthened even more. So if in your life right now, you're trying to make a difficult decision, you need prudence. What you do is, is you stir up your confirmation gifts that you receive in confirmation. You say, Holy Spirit, come now and stir up the gifts that you gave me in confirmation. Maybe I was just a silly, stupid teenager when I got confirmation. Right now, Holy Spirit, I want you to come and stir those gifts up in my soul. In particular, I want you to stir up counsel. Because I need to make a decision about, fill in the blank, my job, my marriage, my budget, my health, my children, my parents, my legal problem, whatever it is. You ask the Holy Spirit to come to bring counsel to help form you in the gift of prudence. So there it is. There's a lot more I could say about prudence. There's hours that we could talk about prudence. I would encourage you, I would exhort you, I challenge you, get a copy of the Summa Theologiae. If you don't know which one to get and you're a member of the New St. Thomas Institute, go in there. We have a whole video on which Summa you should buy. Go to NewStThomas.com, which Summa you should buy and why. We also show you how to read the Summa. And in particular, if you have a pencil nearby, write down Summa Theologiae. You can also just write S-T-H, 2, 2, usually Roman numeral 2, Roman numeral 2. That's second part of the second part. 
questions 47 to 56. It's not that long. That gives you everything Thomas teaches on the virtue of prudence. If you read that, you will become prudent. Well, before we jump into our Latin word of the week, just a few announcements. Uh, the first is, this week we just opened the fall enrollment for the new St. Thomas Institute. If you'd like to take online classes with me in Catholic Church history, maybe you're into Catholic theology, you want to learn more about the way the soul works, you want to learn more about apologetics, how to defend your faith, you want to learn more about Catholic philosophy, the new St. Thomas Institute is the best way to do that. It's the easiest way to do that. You can do it from your phone, your smartphone, your tablet, your computer. We have over 3,000 students in over 60 nations. They are all studying Catholic theology through online video courses. It's extremely cheap. We have lowered the price for the fall enrollment to $47 a month. It's month to month. If you don't like it, you can cancel and quit anytime. It's very easy to do. Um, I would encourage you to try it out. Go in there, check it out. Um, if you don't like it within even the first 20 days or so, let us know. We'll even give you a full refund. No worry. Our goal is to train thousands of people to defend their Catholic faith. And this is one of the easiest and best and least expensive ways to do it. So please check it out. NewStThomas.com. NewStThomas.com. It is the largest Catholic institute online on earth. Check us out. NewStThomas.com. Also, my new novel, the sequel to my best selling novel, Sword and Serpent, about St. George, Constantine, St. Helen, Nicholas, St. Christopher will be coming out. The name is The Tenth Region of the Night. The Tenth Region of the Night refers to an Egyptian myth about a serpent. And you'll see as you read the book how it relates to St. George. And in this book, also St. Catherine of Alexandria, which is in Egypt. So this next book has a lot of Egypt in it. Also has a lot of gladiatorial games, a lot of fighting in it, and a lot of intrigue and a lot of suspense. So if you liked the first book, Sword and Serpent, here is Sword and Serpent 2. It's called The Tenth Region of the Night. This is the first time I've announced the um, title of the book. And I will be organizing a group of about 200 um, launch team participants. Last time we had a bunch of them. Uh, I think we had 200 last time and a bunch of people applied. We didn't get everybody in. We're going to have 200 people. If you apply and you're chosen, you will be given an advanced copy of the book to read. Uh, it's a launch team, 200 people. If you'd like to read my new novel before everyone else does and get an advanced copy for free, please let me know. Go to taylormarshall.com and sign up. We will be choosing 200 people to be part of the advanced launch team for Sword and Serpent 2 titled The Tenth Region of the Night. You can learn more at swordandserpent.com, swordandserpent.com. Okay, the tip of the week. Oh, I already did a tip of the week, but the other tip of the week I was going to say is leave your phone in the car sometimes. If you're going on a date with your spouse, try it. Leave the phone in the car. The negative I found is you can't take photos. The positive is you won't be interrupted. And it's kind of surreal. Like you'll go to the restroom and you won't be able to check your phone. Or if your spouse or your date gets up, you won't be able to like check your phone. You just have to like sit there and think about something to say. It kind of takes you back to, to the 90s, how we all live before we had phones. As you know, if you listen to the podcast, I'm always trying to think of ways to unlock myself from the phone. And so try leaving your phone in the car while you're on a date or at an important meeting. Uh, gift offer, if you'd like to learn more about the four virtues, I wrote a short book that's free for you. You can buy it hard copy on Amazon, or you can get it free digital version at my website, taylormarshall.com. It's called Thomas Aquinas and 50 Pages. There's a whole section in there on the virtues where I go over a lot of the stuff that I'm talking about here, but I do it really fast because I only have 50 pages to go over everything in Thomas Aquinas. That book has been read, 
purchased and downloaded over 60,000 times. It's probably the most popular book right now in print on Thomas Aquinas. Get it for free at my website, taylormarshall.com, upper right-hand corner. And before I give you the Latin word of the week, i got to do my shout-outs to all of you good people who left five-star reviews over at iTunes. Um, thank you so much. As you probably know if you listen to podcasts, if you go to iTunes and rate a podcast, it helps other people find that pod- podcast, kind of like a Google search. And so I always ask you guys, if you would, please, it means a ton to me, go to iTunes and leave me a review. You can leave one star, two star, three star, four star, five star, whatever you think it deserves, and leave a little note there, and I will read out your name and maybe even read out your review. So this week, we have Purity Day, who says, loving the accessibility. We have Master Hagen. I already mentioned him at the beginning of the show. He says, best Catholic podcast on the internet. Also, a big shout out to Andrew Litzow. He wrote a five-star um, comment here, and he is going through RCIA. So welcome to the church, Andrew. And he's using this podcast to supplement what he's learning along the way as he seeks to enter into the Catholic church. He's also a practitioner. I'll just read this here. He says, it is a plus that he, that's me, is now doing Brazilian jiu-jitsu and then loves to work out since I, too, practice Brazilian jiu-jitsu and enjoy working out. I challenge everyone to listen to this podcast for a week and see if you're not hooked. Every time I'm in the gym or running in the woods with my dog, I, const- I am constantly listening to his work. Thank you so much, Dr. Marshall, for putting the podcast out. I'm eagerly waiting for more to come. God bless you and your family. So, Andrew, thank you so much. Also, five-star review from S.J. Osborne. Uh, five-star review from Susie Q. Runs. Thank you so much, Susie. Uh, another five-star review here from WeWex7. And uh, WeWex7 says, um, if you crave even more of these podcasts, then I would recommend you signing up for the new St. Thomas Institute, where Taylor offers courses in philosophy, theology, apologetics, and church history. So WeWex, thank you for that plug and endorsement in the new St. Thomas Institute. If you like this kind of stuff, you like this podcast, it's 10 times more intense and plentiful in the new St. Thomas Institute. Um, And then also DJ Painter left a five-star review. So all of y'all, thank you so much. And for the other 533 of you that have left five-star reviews over at iTunes, thank you, thank you, thank you. I truly appreciate it. If you'd like to leave a review, it takes about 40 seconds just go to taylormarshall.com forward slash shout out. taylormarshall.com forward slash shout out. Now, the Latin word of the week is data. Data. You know, there's that guy in Star Trek, Next Generation, named Data. Well, it comes from the Latin word data, which means something given. Something given. Even a gift. It is something, many things given. Portal here could also be singular, right? Or it could be a feminine, actually, or neuter, datum, something like that. Something given. Uh, St. Augustine named his son Adea Datus, which is Adeo, from God, Datus, same word, just masculine, given, given by God. The reason I chose this Latin word is because it relates to the gifts of the Holy Spirit, but also to the virtues of They're gifts given by God. The most important thing you can do today is not read Thomas Aquinas in a bunch of books, though I want you to do that. The most important thing you can do today is pray to Jesus Christ and say, Lord Jesus, give me the gifts. Give me the gift of counsel. Give me the virtue of prudence to make right decisions. You might say, I've made a lot of bad decisions, God. I've really screwed up a lot. Today, I want to start over. Today, I want to start making good decisions. I want to be a prudent man. I want to be a prudent woman. Uh, many of you have asked for me to close the podcast with a prayer, and so I've wrote, written a prayer, and if you'd like to pray it with me, I've, I've written it with the intention that you would pray along with me. If you'd like to do that, please do. Let's pray together. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Gracious Father, you love us. 
your son Jesus Christ died for us. And in gratitude, I want to know you and to love you in the depths of my broken heart. Because of your kindness, I repent of my sins. And by the fire of your Holy Spirit, allow me to have a deep, personal relationship with you and to draw other people into your love. In Jesus' name, amen. In the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, amen. Well, brothers and sisters in Christ, God has a wonderful plan in store for you, and you are the apple of his eye. That means he protects you and he sees you. And until next time, remember that our Lord Jesus Christ said that you are the light of the world and the salt of the earth. So go out there and be salty. Salty.